Okay, managing plastic waste. Um, this is a huge, huge, wildly um, nuanced topic. So um, again, um, you know, feel free to chime in if you got some input here. Um, by no means am I an expert. I, after kind of spending as much time as I have on this already, I have my doubts that there's anybody out there that is an actual expert on this. So, um, okay, Living Web Farms biochar facility is kind of what you see here. Um, uh, in the past couple of years, 2017 and 18, um, we've kind of gotten hooked on this idea of, of what we call the circular economy. Um, and what we're trying to do is just uh, rethink the way that we look at waste and turn those into resources. Um, biochar production uh, on its own is um, kind of, that's how I see biochar production and that's how I've always been attracted to it. Taking things like sawmill waste, wood waste, um, and uh, turning it into a valuable product for one. Um, it is a uh, carbon negative process which is completely fascinating to me. Um, and, uh, and we actually get energy out of it. So um, out of the projects that we have done in this, this circular economy, agricultural realm, uh, biochar production is kind of the uh, engine to that process. Um, uh, we looked at mill waste and shipping waste, so that's cardboard um, and sawdust briquettes um, early on, uh, middle of last year maybe. Um, we started looking at this work that was um, started from a group called the Legacy Foundation, um, where they're taking cardboard and some agricultural waste, things like sugarcane, bagasse, um, um, I don't know, rice um, holes, and they're turning those um, waste that are traditionally just burned like in open pits on the side of the farm, and they're compressing them into blocks, and this is kind of a low pressure wet method um, where they're able to make uh, fuel briquettes. Uh, and this is, uh, is especially helpful in areas where deforestation is a problem. Um, that is just a kind of a prime example of being able to take something that's a waste and turn it into a usable product. We're looking at excess food waste, which is um, um, probably uniquely Western to have this much excess food waste, but we're able to uh, grow black soldier fly larvae on that food waste. Now, there's quite a few people doing that now. We're experimenting with some 12-month production, year-round production here at the farm. And then we started looking at the same thing for plastic waste. Now we do collect wood vinegar as a byproduct of our charcoal production. Uh, it goes into these plastic containers that we buy used already um, on uh, something like Craigslist or wherever. And, uh, and now we're starting to use that wood vinegar, so we need something to do with the waste plastic that we're generating. Um, we're bringing it in, and now it's too dirty to resell it. It's too dirty, conventional recyclers won't touch it. Um, there's that. We're storing our biochar in big polypropylene bags that are UV damaged. We're bringing in plastic, and by the time we're done with it, it's not good for reuse anymore. So um, we can either landfill it, or we can try to reclaim it, make something useful out of it. Um, so that's kind of what got us looking into plastic. Um, I don't want to start this thing out like a big plastic hit piece. We're not like trying to, trying to hate on plastic in general by any means. We're not trying to rid the world of plastic. Um, uh, so what I wanted to start with is, is look at some objects that would be basically impossible without plastic. I don't know, maybe you guys think that's up for debate, but first are these highly uh, fuel efficient cars that we have now. Um, lightweight material, you know, engineering specs, you can really kind of get into some valuable um, materials that work because they're plastic. We can get the weight down on these fuel efficient cars. Um, I certainly wouldn't want to uh, carry a canvas tent or anything, uh, you know, too far on my back. I guess people used to do that, but it's nice to have an ultralight tent. You know, you guys get the picture. Um, safety glasses, for one, is something I use on a daily basis that uh, um, would be hard to imagine using glass safety glasses, but um, I suppose you could. You guys have anything that you can think of that's uh, maybe plastic that, uh, be really difficult to find a substitute for? Probably microchips. Yeah. Sure. Sure. A lot of electronic components. Definitely. Well, so um, again, some things are only possible because plastic um, is here and material scientists have 
discovered these things and improved upon them and now we have motorcycle helmets and now we have plastic safety glasses and we have greenhouse films so that we can grow food all year long. Um, uh, the problem with plastics is um, actually what's good about plastics. The lightweight, they're cheap, they're um, easy to make and um, economical. So we make a lot of them and we move a lot of them around the globe and we uh, definitely don't uh, take care of it. Um, so plastics are everywhere. There's a pretty low recycling rate in the United States. One thing that I did read, side note, um, India, because uh, assuming because they're it's so impoverished in areas, um, actually has like a 90% recycling rate. Have you heard that? I not. Okay, there's actually people that are, um, you know, you, I'm sure you've seen the images of people collecting plastic from the dumps, um, actually going out to open air dumps, collecting plastic for recycling use. So. Um, uh, this is as much a technical problem as it is an economical problem. Um, you know, a lot of people don't realize that when you buy a product, you actually are purchasing its packaging um, at the same time. So it becomes your responsibility to deal with it. Um, it's not really anybody else's responsibility. Of course, in the world, not everybody has our standards. And, um, you know, I do want to say, too, before we go into, a, a, again, a plastic hit piece, that there are a lot of plastics that are, are pretty much assumed across the board um, to be safe. What uh, gets dangerous about it is um, proprietary blends of plastics that have additives in there that we don't necessarily know what additives are going in. Um, we don't know enough about those additives to um, assume that they're safe all the time. Uh, example, BPA. I mean, BPA is one of these things that we've been making since, uh, I don't know this for a fact, 40s, 50s, I think. And um, it's only really a recent concern that we really started to understand what BPA does. Um, so you kind of have to assume that there's other stuff out there that we don't know. We don't know what we don't know. That's my approach to plastics. Now that may, you know, some people may argue that. Um, um, and certainly microplastics is something that we've only really recently begun to address in a meaningful way. You know, we talk about a lot about landfills and sending plastic to the landfill. I did want to mentioned that um, uh, plastic is probably not as much in the landfill as you think it is. Um, paper, above and beyond, uh, the recyclable material that ends up in landfill is paper products. And uh, construction waste, 30% uh, in the landfill in North Carolina, 32% is uh, demolition materials. Um, I'll take a little side note. I, I did get the blessing to uh, go to Europe um, this past summer Never been to Europe, and um, you kind of fly over um, Spain, and as we're like circling down to land in Spain, uh, what I noticed was like, y you know, you've got farms, and then you've got the city. And um, of course, coming back into Charlotte, um, landing, you see, uh, of course, the, you know, the suburban sprawl that we're all familiar with. But what you also see is a whole lot of bare ground. You see a lot of little uh, backhoes <laughs> driving around. You see a lot of road construction. We just kind of have this constant rebuild, tear it down, and rebuild mentality that um, it's, uh, I, you know, again, before we, we take this all about plastics, we just need to recognize that this is a pervasive problem. It's not just plastics, but um, if we're worried about landfills, we need to, to prioritize. Uh, microplastics is probably, if you guys want to get depressed before we move on, um, uh, a lot of plastic is entering the oceans. Now, this is happening because of, uh, you know, illegal dumping here in the United States. It's also happening because of open air landfills everywhere. Um, uh, there's just a lot of plastic being blown around. Um, it, the problem is this is happening in other countries, but it becomes a global problem. It is happening here in the United States, just not to the degree. The, it, you can go online and you can look at... Um, like the 10 different major waterways in which um, plastic is entering the oceans. It's not happening in the United States that much. But, um, but it is our problem it becomes our, because we consume food that uh, comes from the Pacific Ocean, comes from all oceans. Microplastics are found on all seven continents. Microplastics are less than five millimeters is what, what we're calling microplastics. Now there's this other thing called nanoplastics, which are ultra small, um, little plastic fibers that um, come off of your clothes if you have a 50-50 blend cotton poly t-shirt, then every time you brush up against something, then 
microfibers are entering the air. Every time you get in your car, you've got plastic upholstery, no doubt, in your car. Um, every time I scrape the concrete with my shoes, little plastic bits are coming off. It's a major problem, um, we think. We don't really know like the full degree to which this could be a problem, but we do know that we're finding micro and nanoplastics on all seven continents. Um, these nanoplastics, I just read, are smaller than an algal cell. So an algal cell can actually y y incorporate a nanoplastic into itself. So this is a, on all levels of life. Um, uh, have you guys heard of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch? Okay, now when I heard that, and I, th I assume everybody else is the same, you kind of think like, whoa, twice the size of Texas, you can see it floating from, from space, you know, like why can't we see pictures of that? Um, it's because it's actually, um, uh, this is the best description I've found, debris is more like flecks of pepper floating throughout a bowl of soup. Um, this is not plastic bottles that are floating on top of the ocean exposed to UV light all the time. This is, a lot of stuff is kind of down below uh, direct penetration of UV light, and it's kind of a cold environment. So those are two things that actually help to keep plastics in their stable form more often. So, so they're not breaking down as quickly as we might assume they are out in the sun, in the ocean. Um, but uh, it's really hard to know because of all the different factors that are going in. Um, you might estimate, you know, I saw a lot of estimates saying that a, a plastic bottle takes 450 years to break down in the sun. It might take 450 years on land. We don't know what it takes in the water. You know, we don't know if it's getting abraded from salt water or if it's getting direct UV light penetration. These are like, we really don't know the scale of the problem that we're dealing with. Marine debris, uh, uh, this comes from a study where guys just went out and collected marine debris. Um, we don't really need to get into this in detail, but um, do look at that cigarette butt number. It's almost twice the, the numbers of anything else. Um, you know, that just kind of tells you the scale of the problem. It, it's just um, kind of hard to wrap your head around that many cigarette butts. But um, just driving home last night, you know, you see that little spark dancing down the highway when somebody flicks a cigarette butt out the window. It's, uh, and what are you going to do? Go after a guy for flicking a cigarette butt out the window? I mean, it's just... Uh, you know, you're not going to get pulled over for that. But uh, Okay, so what I want to do for the rest of this little lecture, this will probably take about an, an hour, I uh, assume, is just kind of go down the list of the seven different main commodity plastics. These are the plastics we're using. 70% um, of all plastics are going to be these seven plastics. Um, and, uh, well, six plastics, really. And uh, kind of just tell you a little bit about what they are, what they're used for, how you can recognize them. And then um, uh, maybe offer some advice on how you can not use them in the future. So anybody who's doing the sustainable living stuff, feel free to kind of chime in with your input. So uh, Pete, it's kind of what uh, polyethylene terephthalate, that's a terephthalate, um, uh, used in uh, water bottles. Um, recycling, what they're doing with this stuff is um, mostly spinning it down into polyester fibers. Um, I'm assuming that's probably the main pathway for um, peat. Um, uh, very robust uh, market for recycled material. Um, this is probably the plastic that's getting most recycled in the United States, I, I think. Um, certainly of the top two. Um, again, you recognize the water bottle as being kind of a rigid feeling. Um, uh, can go brittle. This is the stuff that you don't want to leave out in the sun. Um, um, does not contain like the, the big no-nos that we're you know, familiar with, the phthalate plasticizers. Despite phthalate being in its name, does not contain those plasticizers. Um, it does not contain BPA. But again, there may be additives that we don't know what they are. Things like UV um, additives that stabilize it from UV light. A lot of this is recycled and used in fiber production. Yeah, there it is. 80% of it goes back into fiber, which is things like carpet and polyester clothing and um, fleece jackets. This kind of stuff that's, that's everywhere. Challenging for DIY recyclers, um, because of this extra process, it's actually hydrophilic. Like it, It'll pull in moisture. 
And um, for guys like us that are trying to play with it, like make, uh, you know, a lot of people want it. It's a popular 3D printer filament. Um, you can buy new rolls of peat um, as 3D printer filament, but um, it, it's a um, very challenging to, to make that way because it um, wants to boil and pop and release moisture. And uh, there is an extra drying step that's just really hard to do on a DIY level. There are people that are doing it, though. Uh, antimony is used in this. That's uh, probably the thing that got people most afraid of it at first. I've made this extra line. I won't talk about all the other plastics as much as I am Pete, but I did add this extra line about uh, a study that I came across in the EU where they said, okay, only this amount of antimony is allowed in plastic drinking water bottles. But um, one thing that they did find is that antimony is leaching out in juice bottles, which who drinks juice? Kids. And it's because of the juice. I mean, it's possible that the manufacturer just kind of like let that slide. It's also possible that the juice is acidic and it's actually reacting with the plastic and leaching out that way. We don't really know. It's just um, you'll come across this a lot where there's tricky legislation that's really super specific. Like BPA in the United States is only outlawed in children's products. So I've got a little infant. I've got a two-year-old, you know, and of course my two-year-old's like, eating everything in sight and crawling around on my little vinyl floor. I mean, it's just things that, you know, don't know what we don't know. You know, the abrasion from wear and washing clothes of polyester fiber is a major contributor to the microfiber pollution that we're experiencing. Um, there, there's a product you can get, which is probably the, the one place where you can really control it is on your washing machine. If you do um, wash like your fleece jackets or whatever, um, you can get screens that catch microfibers on your wastewater. Um, microbes have been shown to digest it. Of course, this isn't happening on a global scale. This is in a lab, in a dish. But, um, but there is hope. Uh, okay, alternatives to using it. Um, I think those are pretty obvious. Get your uh, reusable water bottle. Everybody knows that. I got a question. Yeah. So if you were doing like a laundry to landscape um, system with your washing machine, you think the microbes like in the soil would break down the plastics or would you want to do the filter on it too just to make sure you're not putting that like on your fruit trees or better for a flower garden? Well, we don't really have any idea about what is happening on a soil ecology aspect. It may be completely negligible. It's also everywhere. So, um, but no, I think you would definitely want to filter it out. This is, again, this is, you know, polyester fibers, plastic fibers. This isn't natural cotton fibers, those kind of things. You know, they'll break down. Um, but yeah, I think you would want to filter that, sure. Um, you guys have heard of PLA? This is the, uh, the corn-based plastic um, that is uh, uh, supposed to break down. I mean, this is a, a good step in the right direction. Now, it definitely has its challenges. Um, one, because it's labeled with the number seven. So how many of you guys think you can recycle that? Now, you don't want to throw that. You don't go throwing that in the... Uh, recycling, municipal recycling stream because, uh, because it's not recyclable. And, and I don't know the extent to which this is actually a problem for somebody like our local recyclers. That was a question I wanted to get out to them is, have you had that experience where a PLA bottle gets mixed in with peat? I, I don't know the extent of it, but it is a problem because there have been I have heard of low, higher truckloads getting rejected just because there was a little bit of PLA in there. there it just is incompatible with yeah. the rest of the recycling process. Now, as a DIY small-scale recycler, you could collect peat and thermoplastically recycle it. You could take it and reform it. But um, again, you're not going to add that to the municipal stream because it's, like she said, if you contaminate one, a, a batch of plastic, like uh, a small amount of another plastic mixed in with that will cause the whole batch to fail. Um, it's the same with cardboard, too. This is news to me, too. But um, uh, if you have a batch of cardboard and you have a greasy pizza box mixed in with that cardboard, you can actually ruin that batch, too. Um, which is, that's, um, I don't know, that's interesting. I've thrown out many pizza boxes. Or, uh, you know, oily, of course we have oily cardboard that we have tried to recycle here too, so that's something we learned. Uh, you can compost it. You can compost it, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and this is corn plastic too. It gets a lot of criticism for diverting from the food supply. 
which um, those are arguments I'm sure um, most of us have heard before. Um, it, the trick, too, is it does compost, sure. Um, it's by design compost in a composting facility, industrial composting facility, um, which means that it has to hit temp and hold it there for a certain amount of time, three to six months. Now, I don't know much about industrial composting, but um, I think that it's a lot faster than three to six months. I think they're all about throughput. So they're trying to move material in and move it back out. So in my reading, I did um, come across um, testimony from uh, in, you know, large scale composters that are rejecting PLA from their process because it takes so long and, um, and uh, they don't want it to kind of slow down the rest of the process. So there's definitely some challenges with PLA, but again, it's a vegetable-based pl plastic, so it's like definitely, absolutely, a step in the right direction. Confusing, right? Complicated, nuance. <laughs> uh, HDPE is probably widely considered one of the safest plastics. If you come across a food-grade plastic, um, chances are it's HDPE, if it's labeled food-grade. Um, uh, this is a strong plastic. This is kind of one of the good guys out there. It's real simple chemical structure. Um, now again, you got to worry about the additives. Um, we don't know what's in the additives. Again, these are proprietary blends most of the time. Um, it's everywhere though. It's in all these bottles. We've got a bag of HDP bottles here. Uh, it's still in a lot of shopping bags too. Tyvek house wrap is actually HDP. I kind of thought it was like something more engineered than that, but it's, it's just a plastic film, I guess. Um, uh, again, uh, a second most robust market for this material. Um, a lot of HDP gets recycled. gets put back into things like films, like trash bags, or um, uh, big trash cans, just kind of lower grade non-engineering plastics. Um, they do build it up to into uh, plastic lumber. Uh, I'll mention this, most plastics do break down in UV light, but HDPE is probably one of the more susceptible um, UV light plastics. So a lot of times, uh, antioxidants and things will be added back into the plastics to help their UV light um, or to slow down their breakdown. Uh, some of those stabilizers are known endocrine disruptors, so we know a little bit about how they act on the body. Uh, additives may leach over time, depends on what's stored in them. Acidic food is probably, you know, something that is... Uh, probably most likely in terms of uh, human health. Anybody seen these symbols before? Oh, this is actually polypropylene, okay. But um, recognize these other symbols that you might see on the back of a bucket or anything that's considered a food grade plastic. Um, this one up here means uh, you can put it in a microwave. This one means that you can bring it up to 110 degrees Celsius. This one means you can put it in the dishwasher. This one means you can freeze it. This one means you can eat off it. That's the food grade symbol. Um, and this is the recycling code. This is the resin code. So that's actually polypropylene, not number two, HDPE. But um, my guess is this came off of uh, probably the back. I didn't take that picture, but um, it's probably off the back of one of those reusable Ziploc um, type uh, containers. Um, again, it's going to be food grade um, specifically because of its lack of additives um, is mostly what's going to make that food grade. Now, um, that's tricky, and again, this is all proprietary stuff, so they don't tell you exactly what their blends are. My guess is that companies like, and maybe this is me just being an optimist, but, but companies like Ziploc or Glad or these companies that make um, reusable plastic containers are probably doing their due diligence to make sure they're safe. Um, because it would be a major, uh, you know, if something were to come up, it would be a pretty heavy hit to their industry. So I kind of tend to, to trust that it's okay. If it's labeled that it's okay. But it is really easy to make mistakes. And how many of you people, like, actually look on the back of a plastic thing and read to see if it's okay to put in the dishwasher or whatever. And how many people do you think really just like do it because they're busy and they're trying to get the kids to bed and they're, you know, there's a lot of nuance and a lot of human behavior issues. Um, so as a whole, 
we still kind of recommend that even though some plastics may be safe, um, you kind of have to assume that not everybody's going to follow the rules or even going to have the capacity to pay attention to all the rules. Um, but I am glad that people are out there labeling that some things are food safe. Um, it's nice to know that there's materials out there that, that have been recognized as safe. Okay, this is my favorite part. This is going to be my favorite part of the whole day. Um, little quiz. What can you uh, look at these three pictures and tell me um, what is in common about all three of those pictures? It's all food storage. That's true. That's not it, but that's true. Good call. Nice. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> all three of these are designed for reuse. So they're packaging that is made to be, it has a use after it's done being packaging. Okay, so the bucket, this is my favorite, the five gallon bucket, which is um, the pickle bucket that comes from Firehouse Subs. Now you can walk in there and you can buy this for $2. And um, it's food grade plastic. And the $2 goes to like a local firefighters fund or something like that. And um, what they've done is it's kind of genius to me. They've, they're advertising Firehouse Subs, and I guess I am too. Um, and they're, um, sure, they're, you know, the money is going to a good cause, and they're getting rid of their pickle buckets. They're not throwing them in the trash. So um, now you've got almost a free food grade five gallon bucket. Um, these jars, spaghetti sauce comes, that's a mason jar that it's coming in. Now, how many jars do you like? You crack the lid and you can't find a lid to reuse it and everything. So that's a universal mason jar that you can use any mason jar lids on it. Um, they used to, I think this is maybe like five or ten years ago, they actually used, you know, they used to say that they're suitable for canning. Now, um, maybe somebody blew a jar up in their canner or something and they don't, they don't say that they're suitable for canning, but um, uh, there are stories of people that do use them for canning and they're perfectly safe for use and reuse and so on. Um, I love that, and I think that they should have that on the label. I mean, why don't they say, this is packed in a mason jar that you can reuse? And um, I don't know, why can't I buy the organic spaghetti sauce that's also in a reusable mason jar? I mean, that's something that should be across the board um, available. Now, this is a really neat story that Richard told me about on the right. Those are flour sacks. You know, you used to be able to buy flour in a, a, in a fabric bag um, that... Um, what they started doing back in the Depression era days, um, they realized that people were actually making clothes out of flower sacks. So on the front end, what they started doing was designing like beautiful patterns into the clothes. Uh, so that it kind of like, again, it's designed on the front end for reuse later on down the line. That just about gives me goosebumps. Um, so, okay, mason jar there. There's a dress that's made out of flower sacks. So we're not joking around. I mean, that's, uh, that's pretty nice. Amazing, isn't it? Okay, and then I, I don't know if you guys have gotten in. I'm gonna, almost going to call it like a five-gallon bucket subculture. Um, but there's people that know about five-gallon buckets, and there's people that don't. But um, <laughs> you can do almost anything with a five-gallon bucket. You guys on farms, I'm sure you know that. Um, but um, you got to really love five-gallon buckets to, to wear one as a backpack. That was probably my favorite. <laughs> that's, you, you're getting pretty deep if that's a... You know, I could send your kid to school in that, but uh, um, just some unique ideas. Now, you can get online. I think I've got a link at the end of this, um, um, various links of people that are just uh, collecting all these different ideas that you can do with five gallon buckets. Um, anybody else, like, got any clever ideas on five gallon buckets? You can make them out of green bills. Yeah, that's great. Wonderful. I have a question about those five gallon buckets, especially, particularly those, those pickle buckets. How do you clean them? How do you get that pickle smell out? <laughs> Yeah, they do smell. Um, they do smell. Uh, so I've read about people just leave them outside, like in the light, in the sun, for a couple of weeks. Um, some people can kind of like circumvent that by loading them up with coffee grounds. That's the trick. Now, I don't know if you're just covering the smell or if you're like pulling the smell out. I don't know. You can, uh, they do smell like white them. vinegar, too. White vinegar really strips it, and peroxide, uh, not, not, not full Spanish, but 3% peroxide, 50 50 water. 
will help. Okay. Cool. I wonder if activated charcoal would do it too. Uh, you know, I read about somebody uh, activated maybe, but somebody tried some homemade charcoal and it didn't really do the trick. But um, I think it's probably a, the most successful have just been time waiting. But um, yeah, I haven't tried. I haven't heard about the peroxide. You said oh, white vinegar. White vinegar is probably the, the cheapest and, and most effective. Really. Great. Okay, these are uh, kind of just a real quick little neat ways to use mason jars in ways that you might not have seen. I love those little plastic um, reusable lids. You know, we store all of our bulk food in mason jars now, and it's like my water bottle, it's my Tupperware, it's uh, everything. One kind of a, a neat idea uh, is the, the jar caddy, so that now you can take those to the store for purchasing um, from bulk food suppliers. I don't know if you guys have seen that. You guys, have you come across anything like this, ways to avoid plastic when you're shopping? We use like cotton sacks. Yeah. Like hand sewn little bags. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's the main thing. Yeah. Okay, PVC, this is probably one of the, the ones that gets the most amount of uh, hate from environmental activists, mainly because of its uh, uh, production methods. And uh, I will say in the United States and in Europe, it's probably pretty generally pretty safe and pretty well regulated industry, I would assume. But Overseas, we can't assume that about production overseas. What is most dangerous about it is the fact that it has chlorine and the production of chlorine and some of the off-gassing from that process um, leads to a lot of uh, nasty waste, water, and gases. It's also, it's DIY recycler is something that we just want to completely stay away from um, because we tend to make mistakes when we're recycling and the, uh, uh, the gases that are released from this when you overheat it are widely known to be um, toxic, hydrochloric acid and uh, dioxins and those kind of things. Um, those are bioaccumulative um, gases too. Some of these are, are things that you don't readily uh, metabolize in your body. Um, so we generally try to stay away from, from PVC, although it is pretty inert as a, as a pipe, you know, as a rigid PVC pipe, it is pretty inert and pretty safe for that matter. Um, if you follow the rules, if it doesn't become too UV damaged or if you don't send water that's too hot through it, um, you know, it can be pretty safe. It's a decent uh, wastewater pipe system. Um, it can also be solvent welded, which is kind of nice. You don't have to thermally weld it. It can be glued. Uh, where, where it gets a little tricky is when you try to make flexible PVC by adding uh, phthalate plasticizers. Check out these PVC pants. <laughs> yeah, it's just for softening PVC. Um, phthalate plasticizers have a very bad reputation. Now, the industry has made some efforts to make it safer. Um, using different plasticizers, heavier weight plasticizers don't leach as, as much. You, there's a lot of back and forth. This is probably the most um, widely, I don't want to say debated, but, but if you get online and you Google PVC phthalate plasticizers, you're going to get the most aggressive environmental activist and you're going to get the most aggressive plastic lobbyist and um, you're going to hear the most widely polarizing opinions. Um, phthalate um, phthalates probably are, for the most part, metabolized in the human body in a pretty short amount of time. Um, the, the stuff that they've seen is, is phthalates and rodents are causing some really uh, serious issues, but we don't know what we don't know. Um, this is only some relatively recent have people begun to take this stuff seriously. So um, uh, industry is definitely making some steps towards safer phthalates, but um, on a whole, um, again, this is probably something we're just going to advise to stay away from as much as possible. LDPE, this is uh, a lot like high density polyethylene. It has a, kind of the same uh, monomer, I think is the word, but a different shape in the way that it branches out. Um, it's uh, kind of a flexible, um, lighter weight, easier to tear version of HDPE that's used in a lot of films, plastic bags, that kind of thing. Um, HDPE will float and will break down into microplastics. Bags are especially dangerous out in the environment because they kind of like can clog drainways and hold water and breed microbes and all that kind of stuff. Um, here's some bioplastic films. This is pretty neat. Now, we talked about PLA earlier. These are some newer plant-based um, plastics that are maybe a little bit more exciting. They are to me. NV Plast is um, actually made from, you guys know cassava plants? Um, now it's actually made from a non-edible part of the cassava plant, which is 
pretty nice, very easily biodegradable. Um, can actually uh, stand up for quite a while, so it's useful as a packaging material, um, especially in electronic packaging. It actually has a really neat uh, electrical properties. EvoWare is a seaweed-based thing that basically dissolves in hot water. So there's some pretty neat uh, innovations happening. Interesting, both of these are coming out of Indonesia, which is um, one of the countries that's probably most affected by ocean plastics. Polypropylene, this is basically, uh, it, it, we can think of it a lot like HTP. It has some different qualities. It's a little uh, more rigid. This, these, these toys right here are polypropylene. My little uh, kids like little plastic chair. Um, this dustpan that we repaired is uh, polypropylene. It actually gets put in a lot of uh, objects that are, um, you know, there's definitely some food packaging, but it, you find it a lot more in kind of this like middle ground, plastic, durable, durable goods. Same with PE, it's uh, gonna photo oxidize out in the water and uh, it's, uh, you know, requires the additives and everything there to make it not do that. Interesting, we found it's actually really easy to injection mold. I think that's probably, if you see something that you know has been injection molded, um, there's a good chance that it's uh, PP. Those bags outside, you know, the big bags that I talked about earlier, the um, reusable agricultural bulk sacks, those are polypropylene. Polystyrene is another one of these that, um, as uh, plastic waste avoidance activists, you, you generally try to stay away from polystyrene. This, again, has mostly to do with its manufacturing process and some of the, uh, uh, it used to be made with the chlorofluorocarbons, the CFCs, that we know to be pretty potent greenhouse gases. Now it's still made with HFCs, which are also potent greenhouse gases. Again, uh, probably not that big of a deal in industrialized countries uh, that, are, that are doing well and they're well regulated, but we know this stuff is happening everywhere. Uh, it's not just uh, Europe that's making plastics. This is the, uh, the polystyrene foams that are so notorious for um, making their way into the environment. And this is probably one of the most um, long-lasting plastics. This is one that by nature will not photodegrade. Um, so it gets a lot of attention because, it, I think, it, because it's um, floating around whole. You know, these are pieces that are probably washing up on shore. They're not breaking down in little bits quite as fast unless you get styrofoam. You guys have all seen styrofoam cups that break into little styrofoam balls. Now they're making their way around, and animals are eating them. It's very visible. Birds, fish are mistaking those for food, and they are eating them. And it's definitely a problem. Animals are dying. It, the thing about polystyrene foams uh, is that they're, they're incredibly low density. So it makes things like shipping them from one place to another, less economical in terms of recycling. Now in Asheville, there is, you guys have heard of the hard to recycle events. Um, have you guys heard of that? You work them? Fantastic, great. Now this is out in Buncombe County, different areas of Buncombe County, there'll be a hard to recycle event where you can bring in things like um, fluorescent light bulbs or styrofoam or old TVs, electronics, those kind of stuff. And there will be trucks that are there ready to take them to recyclers. Um, it's just something that um, conventional recyclers, this is stuff that it's hard for them to handle in, in quantity. So pay attention to that. And anybody that's looking on the internet, if you need something to do to help your community out, um, hard to recycle events seems like a fantastic place to start. The next one's coming up in November, and that happens to be in South Asheville. Um, in Arden, so it's close enough to to people here. Come on, check it out on Green Asheville Greenworks website. See what you can bring. Come on, bring it in. You don't have to be in Buckham County to come. We have people coming in from other counties all the time. Okay, now one of you guys is you're a mushroom grower. Who's that's you? Have you seen this? Yeah. Okay, this is news to me. This is actually a, a kind of a styrofoam packaging um, substitute that's made out of mushroom mycelium. So I think how they're making this, and maybe you know more about this, is they're, they're making a kind of a, a, a shape. Um, sometimes on a 3D printer, they're making a really kind of a, a super light network um, 
and, and they're packing it with sterilized biomass that they're then inoculating with the uh, probably oyster mushrooms, I think. And, and then they're basically, uh, over the course of time, they're growing them into custom uh, styrofoam packaging shapes, which they can then later be, they can be eaten. I don't know if they can be eaten by humans, but they can certainly be eaten by animals. There's almost no nutritional content there. But um, they can either be eaten or they can be composted. Pretty neat. This is definitely still in the early stages of development. But um, some big companies have jumped on, on board with this. I, I read that IKEA recently jumped on. I don't know the extent to which they're using it, but, um, but they say they're using it in their packaging now. Pretty neat stuff. Uh, okay, some of those other, we saw that number seven earlier when we talked about PLA. Now, number seven is kind of a catch-all for other plastics that can be recycled that are likely not being recycled. So what's neat is as DIY recyclers, because we're so small and we're working in small batches, that, um, that these are things that we can actually recycle, which is kind of neat. ABS is um, uh, kind of a blend of plastic uh, acrylic and styrene and uh, polybutylene rubber, so it kind of has the qualities of all three of those. It is kind of tough, it's resilient, so um, it's, that's actually what makes it nice for Legos because they kind of stretch a little bit when you, so the little uh, bumpers, plastic bumpers, that kind of stuff, and I don't know about the whole bumper, but parts of them are made from ABS. Polycarbonates is another one of these plastics that um, you got to be careful with because um, you know you hear a lot about BPA. I kind of always assumed before I learned this that BPA is just something that people add to plastics. You don't really know why it's there. It is actually the starting material for making polycarbonate. Very lightweight. Um, it's very tough. It's what your safety glasses are made out of. It's impact resistant. It's what they're making motorcycle helmets out of, that kind of stuff. How many of you guys know about the old Nalgene bottles? The, the, the reusable drinking bottles? They're kind of, it was kind of a fad when I was in college. Like everybody was carrying around their Nalgene, going backpacking. Like, and uh, they, they kind of got called out for having BPA. This is when I first heard about it, it was maybe 10 or 15 years ago. And, and they moved to making all their bottles out of HDPE now but they were made out of polycarbonate because I think you could be like rock climbing or something and you're, you've got your water bottle and you drop it down the cliff. It's not going to break. You know, that's, that's kind of how they got their name. At least that's how I came across it. Anyway, so um, this is the plastic that is uh, um, probably no, most notorious for leaching BPA. Now, BPA is not just in polycarbonate. It's used in some other... Well, it, it, in most plastics it is. It's actually in BPA epoxies that are... Um, lining like steel cans, canned food. So BPA is, is kind of everywhere. You guys, I'm sure you've heard a little bit about it. It mimics estrogen in the body, um, which can lead to all kinds of bizarre reproductive effects. You know, it's kids, like I said earlier, it's, uh, they've outlawed it in children's products, but anybody who has kids know that your children get into everything, not just their toys. Uh, there are a lot of other plastics and a lot of other additives in those plastics that have been shown to have the same health effects that BPA does. Maybe not as potent or as strong, but they do have the same estrogen mimicking qualities. EPA, or FDA, sorry, again says it's okay to assume in small amounts, but that's if you follow the rules, and we know because how many cigarette butts are floating in the ocean, we know how many people are not following the rules. It's kind of best maybe just to change the design up front and say let's get this stuff out of here, or let's at least disclose it so that we know where it is. So that's why activists are saying avoid plastic food packaging until we know more about it. Non-EA mimicking plastics are available. There are groups. You can go online and you can search for services that you can, if, if you want to know if this type of food packaging that you're using has any estrogen mimicking compounds in it, you can send your plastic off and they will for a fee test for um, those compounds. And I don't know actually if they disclose um, that for free, but um, there are studies that um, scientists have looked at a uh, broad spectrum of very popular food packaging plastics. There's some 200 or so that you can go to the grocery store now and purchase, and they're finding it um, in very high numbers, percentages, they're finding these compounds. Um, again, we suspect that those are coming from the additives that are added to the plastics. Here's a concept that's um, kind of moving a little bit away from plastics, but it is about recycling. Um, what is 
comment about these three items. How many of you guys have heard monstrous hybrids before? OK. These items, by design, are impossible to compost, and they're impossible to process in a recycling plant. Because they are, you've got your coffee cup that has the plastic lining in it. Yeah, canvas, this is new to me, but canvas is actually mostly um, cotton and PVC. Yeah. And, uh, and the 50-50 the t-shirt. So we'll kind of wrap this up. Plastics are incredibly complicated. Who feels like they know more about plastics now? <laughs> Who feels like maybe they know a lot less? <laughs> yeah, it certainly uh, could go a long ways here. Um, here's something neat that I read on a, um, and this really stuck with me because it's, uh, it kind of tugs at my heartstrings a little bit because this came off of a, one of these pro-industry plastic sites where they describe plastics as having a democratic leveling effect. That's kind of a new one, which means that there may be a time where we couldn't all afford to have, like, whatever they used to make helmets out of, leather and whatever, you know, where those products were not available to us. Now we can all go out and buy helmets. My son can ride a bike and, you know, protect his head with a plastic helmet that's relatively cheap. We can all get in airplanes and fly around right now. Lightweight airplanes are made out of a lot of plastic. You know, it kind of puts luxury in the hands of a lot of people. Now, therein also lies the problem that a lot of people are consuming things on a level that is just um, mostly unsustainable. Polymer science is very advanced when you get into it. These are things that mostly kind of scare people because they don't understand it. You got to admit that, that we don't know what we don't know. And when we don't know something, we can either ignore it or we can be a, afraid of it until we learn about it. So as DIY recyclers, it gets really, becomes something where you have to know a lot to be able to do it. And you have to know a lot to know that you're doing it safely. And there's just so much information out there. And it's coming from activists who are saying one thing. And it's coming from industry who's saying another thing. And it's just, you got to filter the noise. And that is really challenging which is why most activists are saying, let's just stay away from it until we know more. When additives are undisclosed, there's more uncertainty. Uh, another thing, too, is there's little uniformity. When we have, like, uh, one plastic bottle that's labeled number two, and then we have another plastic container that's used for a different application that's labeled number two. Now, those are still, they start out as HDPE, but then when you start adding additives for different uses and stuff, now they become a different product altogether when you mix the two together. Which means that plastics, when you, it, it always becomes a downgrade. Like when you take a large amount of number two and you mix them all together, you don't know what it is, so you have to assume that it's a downgrade all the time. Which is kind of a unique position that we're in doing small batches is, um, Richard, right beside you, there's a red bowl that I made. Now that's not pretty, and it's definitely not as pretty as any of the precious plastic stuff. But it's a start. And I know that that bowl is entirely made out of red plastic Folgers coffee cans, you know, which is probably all the same uh, additives go into there. So it has the same mechanical properties, thermal properties, as red Folgers coffee cans. Now, everything else over there is basically a mix of plastics. Now, that's a unique um, position that we're in as being very small DIY recyclers. Plastic health and environmental concerns. In, in, and we come across this in organic biodynamic farming all the time, is that it's hard to break things down to reduction of science and say, like, we know that this is doing this, and we know that this is doing this. Now, there's a lot more scientists that are looking at plastic and how it affects your health. But, but what is really hard to see is the accumulative effects of all of these different things that we're exposed to. And sure, BPA may be doing this specifically, but exposure over the long term is really hard to know. Exposure to that in combination with this, in combination with PVC plasticizers, we don't really know. But we do know that it's everywhere, and that it's on all seven continents, and it's in the seafood that we're eating now. And it might be in the air that we breathe. I'll be ad admit it out front. I think what probably gets people, like myself, most upset about this is just the blatant disregard for um, future generations that comes with single-use plastics. We are saying we're going to pull this thing out of the earth that took 
thousands of years to make, and we're going to turn it into something that we're going to use for five minutes, and then we're going to put it in a landfill where it's going to sit for eternity again. And so we're taking something, this thing that has been given to us, and we are literally using it for seconds and throwing it away. And I think that's probably what it, what it really comes down to is, um, is that we know we can do better, so let's do better. It's kind of an ethical decision at that point. Mm-hmm.